So welcome back from lunch and coffee, everyone. Um, we'll continue now with a session we've titled Perspectives. Uh, in his opening remarks, Alf mentioned the current media situation in India and uh, the troubled nature of that situation. So we're extremely happy to have um, what is in effect a, a keynote on what's happening to the media in India. We have a full 90 minutes for this session, which uh, gives us plenty of time for both the presentation itself and for a subsequent uh, discussion on this very important topic. Uh, we're also extremely happy to have with us uh, Siddharth Vardarajan, uh, who really needs no further introduction, but he will get one anyway. Um, he's, as you know, a former editor of The Hindu and the founding editor of uh, The Wire, uh, one of the most important online news portals uh, that's both editorially and financially independent. Uh, the CV is, of course, far too long to read out. Uh, he's been a visiting professor uh, at the Graduate School of Journalism at UC Berkeley and appoints a fellow at uh, Yale and, of course, the editor of one of the earliest and most comprehensive accounts uh, of the 2002 Gujarat uh, pogroms, a book uh, titled Gujarat, Making of a Tragedy. So welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. And I'll be back uh, once you're done to moderate the rest of the discussion. Thank welcome. I can be quite indisciplined as far as time goes, so maybe if I if I go beyond a certain point, then just let me know. Then I will I will try to wind down, because when it comes to the media, uh, there is really uh, uh, an enormous lot to be to be said, and uh, you know I appreciate. I'm happy to have this opportunity at this conference. Uh, thank you, Alf, for inviting me, and um, you know I will essentially take about 40, 45 minutes to paint what I regard as a broad overview of the media landscape as it exists today, as it has evolved over the last decade, decade and a half, and how the kind of coverage that we see today of political developers in the country is very closely linked to the manner in which the industry as a whole has evolved, and in particular, its political economy, uh, the political economy of its business model. That's what I will try to explain and analyze. And I will, in the latter half, try to deal with the question that has been bothering me and a lot of other journalists in India, which is that the diagnosis many of us make of the crisis of the Indian media being linked to corporate control, excessive dependence on advertising, um, you know, profit-oriented media, holds more or less true, say, of the big media in the, in the United States. Yet, big media in the United States is approaching the challenge of covering the Trump administration in ways that are very different from the way in which big media is handling the challenges of covering the Modi government. So what might some of the reasons for that be, notwithstanding the similarity or the superficial similarity in terms of underlying political economy? So I will offer some speculative uh, thoughts on that, and uh, then hopefully um, you know, we can open the floor for discussion. So let's start with the fundamental question which is why are we talking about the state of the media in the first place? Before I became a journalist, I used to uh, be an economist and over the last 15, 20 years, I've attended lots of events of this kind that bring together essentially academic specialists on the politics or sociology or the history of India. Uh, in order to analyze currently unfolding events from an academic perspective or to find historical, to trace out historical, traje historical trajectories and so on and so forth. Very rarely 
um, has the media really figured as a topic of discussion? Neither during Rajiv Gandhi's time or Narasimha Rao or, uh, the ten, or, or Vajpayee's era either, though they were, there are moments or there are elements of, you know, you can trace the history of some of current media practice, some official current media practice back to the Vajpayee era, but I don't recall at that time, I was then at the Times of India, and I don't recall academic conferences or, you know, focusing attention on the state of the media as an important element of, of discussion. And so, so clearly something has changed, and there is a perception among those who study India that perhaps an element of Indian democracy or Indian society that everyone took for granted, which was that the free, independent nature of media, with all its aberrations and problems, uh, was something that you could rely on, something that you could you know, take as a given and look at other elements of other changing elements of an equation because the media more or less was a kind of constant. If it was bad in the 60s, it you know, carried on being bad in the 70s or 80s. It's not as if new elements of badness or goodness crept in. Uh, so there was this idea of predictability, which meant that we weren't really looking at uh, media except when it came to specific problems. So how is the media covered or contributed to communalization? So there would be discussions on that. Um, but not any attempt to have a broad overview of uh, the state of the media itself. And so this is, this is new and is clearly a reflection of what those of us in the media see and perceive, but also those of you who are outside, as really un an unprecedented level of, of pressure operating from within and without on the media in India. So these are very different, very unique times. Um, superficially, if you look at numbers, it may seem as if these are really the best of times for, for the Indian media. You have large number, a large number of newspapers, TV channels, rising viewership and circulation. Now you have internet. Every day a new website or a new portal um, opens not just in English or Hindi, but in different languages. Facebook, Twitter, social media use is exploding. The access of the ordinary citizen to different forms of media is unprecedented. The ability of people, citizens, to participate in you know, some sort of a conversation with the producers of, of media is also unprecedented. So why, despite this, you know, st st view, this idea of statistical buoyancy, uh, do we speak in terms of pressure? And what is the nature and what is the kind of pressure that we perceive? I think that's really the fundamental question. Those of you who watch different private television channels will be familiar with a phrase that crops up in, <coughs> crops up frequently in, say, Republic TV or Times Now, which are the two largest English language television, you know, news television channels. I say largest with a pinch of salt because we don't, you know, we don't really have reliable data, but just judging by the amount of advertising that they carry as some sort of an indicator and uh, their ability to move conversations on social media, they are clearly dominant players when it comes to English at least. And so the phrase that their anchors love using is, you know, they, they speak of themselves as being outliers, uh, in, some, in some ways rebels, in some ways uh, those who are recapturing the kind of authentic media space from what they call disparagingly the Latians media. And they will mispronounce Latians as Lutians and say, and make a very poor pun uh, to say that these are all looters, uh, so Lutians media. And the idea is that um, what they run down as mainstream or big media uh, is, in their view, you know, it's, it's a compromised media, it's a media that has been in the payroll of the uh, Congress party and the Gandhi, the Gandhi family. And 
what they present as authentic, genuine journalism is essentially uh, journalism which aims to speak for the voice of the nation. So you have a, a you know, very explicitly articulated nationalist uh, media voice. Again, this is something very new. Even during, you, you, I mean, the, the only, perhaps, the earlier shade of this that you would have encountered, and even then it was really quite momentary, was during the Kargil War, when in many ways private television came into its own. You had channels that, that vied with each other. They were able to send correspondents to the battle, battle zone thanks to um, the Indian Army's willingness to take some of these people up there. And there was very you know, heightened nationalist coverage, but it, it really lasted two or three months. And you know, very soon, channels moved on to other things. But this conscious packaging of yourself as you know, nationalist media, that, that, the, that media which, is, which does not put India first, is not authentic, is not genuine media, is something that really is very, very new. To the, to the, perhaps in 62, um, there would have been some of this, but I, I wonder to what extent um, it would have been so blatant and so uh, in your face as we see now. And of course, electronic, you know, television has a way of magnifying uh, these, uh, this, this entire uh, discourse. So the right wing media, which is essentially big media, the two biggest channels, and you know, the Hindi, Hindi channels which have a wider reach uh, actually also echo and speak in the same voice. So the largest Hindi channels, Aaj Tak, for example, or um, Z News, or India TV. Uh, so actually the largest probably India TV, and followed by Z, for, and then Aaj Tak in third place. Also uh, very consciously articulate. So Aaj Tak is interesting because it's part of Living Media Group, which runs India Today magazine, and India Today has, if you will, a split personality. So some of their anchors um, go down the ultra-nationalist path, others try to hew a more middle-of-the-road tone. But the you know, big Hindi media also um, has thrown all normal journalistic or editorial guidelines to the wind and revels in this idea of India first as being the guiding principle of their journalism. So this is the, you know, the division that you have, the, the, the biggest media channels um, are the most vocal in running down anybody that is critical of the government, describing them as Latians media, Lutians media, anti-national media. Uh, it's not uncommon for them now to take pot shots at specific anchors, specific websites. When we ran um, a piece, a critical piece by Professor Partho Chatterjee in The Wire on the um, human shield incident where the Indian, where a major of the Indian army caught hold of a Kashmiri uh, man who had just voted as it, as it turned out and strapped him to the front of uh, their Jeep and drove him around. Uh, and so Partho Chatterjee kind of made a historical analysis of the language used to justify this kind of violation of human rights and saw in the justification that the army chief made echoes of some of what General Dyer had said when he was asked about the Jallianwala Bagh. It was a very nuanced piece. The comparison was not between the Jallianwala Bagh massacre and uh, the, the Human Shield incident per se. Uh, but even if it was, it's a point of view of an academic, and that, you know, that's where matters should rest. But you had instead uh, a frenzy for two, day, two or three days uh, with these channels chasing him trying to put him on the spot, running him down as an illiterate, as an anti-national, uh, all of this with the backing of, and, and with a green light given on Twitter by, by the information and broadcasting minister who picked this entire con con controversy up, I think 72 hours after the piece was published. It was a kind of calculated move to try to whip up hysteria. So that's kind of uh, the right-wing media, which is taking pot shots at everybody else. And of course you have uh, critics of these channels and these newspapers, uh, who also, you know, Arun Shori has uh, famously used the phrase North Korean, North Korean channels. He describes uh, Times Now Republic as uh, North Korean media because of the way in which they adulate the dear leader and 
treat all of his critics as enemies of the nation, enemies of the people. Um, my sense after watching some of these channels, particularly over the last two months, is that um, North Korean is correct. I mean, th there is a strong element of the North Korean uh, you know, approach, but there is also a strong element of Rwandan in the sense of actually inciting now, uh, and I'm, I'm referring to uh, the role played by Radio Milkolin and other Rwandan uh, mass media outlets in the run up to the genocide in the 90s, when now fairly well documented, you know, it's well documented the manner in which you run down a minority, use pejorative terms, uh, you kind of allow, uh, you s sort of invite public comment uh, in, the, in the form of phone-ins or, you know, comments on, so, so the role that a phone-in uh, played in, in early 90s Rwanda is played by social media today. Uh, but essentially, uh, day after day, week after week, channels like Times Now and Republic TV are uh, busy in constructing a strong anti-Muslim narr narrative. So issues, any news item that connects peripherally to the project of vilifying Muslims will occupy a prime time space on these channels. The format is predictable. You will have an angry anchor fulminating on, after a, a very, very tendentious four or five minute news clip is played followed by um, studio commentators who uh, are drawn allegedly to represent different points of view. But uh, if it is, and as often these shows do include a so-called Muslim topic, then you will have um, so-called Muslim leaders from central casting, as it were, who, you know, play, uh, who, who, you know, who will provide the most obscurantist defense of allegations that these channels will mount. Uh, and you cannot come away after watching this show except to be filled with a sense of revulsion at, uh, you know, like you have, you have to, in the sense that the entire idea is to vilify Muslims, so you, so you will pick up a topic, present it in a tendentious way, have uh, reactionary Muslim leaders who will then uh, rise to the bait and this happens day after day, which is why I, I feel that there is a narrative and there is a mindset being created, uh, which, is, and I, I, which, I, which is why I go with the Rwandan uh, analogy also, and that you know, some of these anchors, um, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with, but you know, bizarre topics will be you know, entirely fabricated. There's, there's a student from JNU who has been missing now for about a year, and you know, first the time he was targeted by the ABVP, uh, shortly before his disappearance. We don't know whether that's the reason he disappeared or you know, it's, it's really a bit of a mystery. But uh, the fact that the police haven't been able to find him is uh, a subject of great concern in JNU and elsewhere in the country. And from time to time to sort of diffuse the anger of students at the fact that one of their own has been missing and not been traced, various stories will be planted. So first a story was planted in the Times of India as to how the browsing history of Najib uh, that the police recovered from his computer showed that he was searching for ISIS. Uh, and this was, a, this was a story that ran on the front page of Times of India, completely fabricated story, a story that the police itself was forced to deny. Uh, and the paper published a, a tiny retraction way inside, um, but yet, and yet kept the story online. It didn't pull the, the online story version down. And that same story has been revived a few weeks ago with one of the channels claiming that he's actually gone to Syria. And all entirely without any basis, and then you will have a whole debate on how Indian Muslims are being seduced by ISIS. And the entire, you know, and this happens night after night on these, on these channels. And um, the, uh, you know, in terms of what these channels cover, what they don't, uh, it's, it's very clear that there is an attempt to drive media discourse in ways that the uh, government would want media discourse to be driven. Issues or topics that are embarrassing to the government are consciously kept out. There was this amazing moment in one of these channels um, when the anchor was trying to, had assembled a panel to discuss, I think it was, um, why did one madarsa in Uttar Pradesh uh, not 
sing Vande Matram or something of that kind. And at some stage during the program, news broke about all these children dying in a hospital in Gorakhpur. And one of the guests said, you know, I think that we should talk about the death of children in Gorakhpur. And the anchor got outraged and said, um, you know, how dare you divert attention from the real issues? Uh, the, re the real issue being, uh, why did this mother, one mother son in Uttar Pradesh not sing Vande Matram or, or, or whatever the topic was? So, so there is a sense in which, you know, you don't want to have debates or discussions on this. Major incident of, uh, in, in Mansour uh, four months ago when uh, peasants, farmers were fired upon in Madhya Pradesh and killed. Six of them died in one incident. Not a single channel uh, broke into its programming to present this as breaking news, uh, let alone have a debate that evening on, uh, on a topic like this. So, th so there is a sense in which content is being, you know, it's very clear that the, the content on, uh, uh, on uh, Indian television uh, is being fashioned in a certain way. And uh, why this is, you know, the fact that and this is now big, people are beginning to notice, and I think that's part of the, uh, the sense of alarm when we say what's happening to the Indian media. And I think it's to understand the uh, manner in which topics get selected and how they get treated that we need to take a step back and ask ourselves a little bit about uh, how the media in India are actually structured today, how do certain decisions get taken. And uh, where is this pressure coming from that, is, that, that we see uh, in, in different shapes and forms? And if I can just talk for a few minutes about different kinds of threats, different kinds of pressures, because I often get asked, uh, people are always curious to know, you know, if you look at the, the freedom of the press index, India does pretty poorly. I think it's 134 or 135. It slipped a few positions. And uh, in many ways, this is surprising even for those of us in India because, you know, um, we are conscious of how difficult the media environment is, not so much because of physical threats, although they also exist, uh, but because of things that can't be measured that, or that are in many ways intangible. Uh, and yet, uh, by any objective accounting of, of media freedom, which is what some of these specialized agencies do, India also scores badly. So there is the reality of that ranking. And uh, the fact is, I mean, we've, we've had two, two recent murders in the last uh, last month alone of uh, Gauri Lankesh and uh, Shantanu Bhamik. Lankesh is an example of, of an editor killed for her, her views and her ideology. Uh, we don't know the identity of, of who killed her yet in terms of uh, the conspirators or even the shooters, but we know who celebrated, we know the logic that they employed after she was killed. A BJP MLA from Karnataka even went so far as to say that had she not uh, been critical of the RSS, she might have been alive today. And uh, similar statements have come from uh, these sorts of people. Uh, we don't know, as, as I said, this is still an open question, but it's clear that um, whoever targeted her, targeted her because they didn't approve of what she was writing and what she was saying, and she was a very prominent uh, personality in, in the uh, politics and society of Karnataka. And, and the second example of Shantanu Bhomik, which is equally disturbing because here is an example of a journalist, a reporter in Tripura, who was out covering a political rally. Tripura politics is interesting because this is uh, one of two states still ruled by the Communist Party. And uh, the uh, BJP is determined to dislodge them one way or the other from Tripura. Earlier, Mamta Banerjee, uh, was considered to be the favorite to dislodge them, if at all. And now the BJP reckons it's in with a chance, also because it's growing very rapidly in, in West Bengal, and a large chunk of voters in Tripura are of Bengali origin. Uh, so you have a rally taking place in, uh, in outside Agartala by, uh, by a, uh, a political group to whom the BJP is sympathetic, and a reporter covering the rally uh, is attacked by members of that formation, the mob forms, he's killed on the job. And, uh, you know, this is, um, in recent memory, you know, there have been shootings, assassinations, um, maybe beatings in a, in, a, in a kind of mob situation. But in, in recent times, to c come across uh, an example of a journalist actually being killed on the job in this, in this fashion, uh, it's pretty rare and in a way is alarming. It speaks volumes for the kind of threats. So, so there are physical threats that are uh, at one end of the whole continuum of threats that journalists face in India today. But, but beyond that, you have, a lots, you have lots of other forms of pressure which 
are exerted on the media by the government, by other players. Uh, in the Northeast, you have um, uh, underground or insurgent groups that often um, uh, browbeat or threaten editors and journalists to cover or not cover certain things, similarly in Kashmir. Uh, so the, the, you know, the physical threats are, are a problem, but uh, beyond uh, physical threats, you have, um, if we were to start by looking at official forms of pressure, the misuse of investigating agencies by the government, so the recent raid on NDTV, the promoter of NDTV, Pranoy Roy, by the Central Bureau of Investigation, a very, very flimsy case based on a private complaint filed many years ago of um, potential loss caused to a private bank by discounting a loan that NDTV had taken. Uh, you'd imagine that this is hardly an issue that the CBI ought to get into, but the CBI got into it and pursuant to its sudden investigations, they raid the house of, of Pranoy Roy. And the idea really was to send a very clear signal to not just NDTV and Pranoy, but any other media organization that was uh, you know, that is not falling in line in terms of reporting events exactly the way the government wants, because those of you who watch media in India know that NDTV is the one channel where you have um, some amount of, um, you know, criticism of the government. And uh, in a fairly consistent manner, a refusal to simply tow the official uh, sequence of events. Recently when, um, Anyhow, uh, so, so NDTV is, you know, the, the, the government had tried about six months ago to uh, close down the channel for one day, the Hindi channel, NDTV India, again on a very flimsy, uh, on very flimsy grounds, and the rest of the media fraternity united and put pressure on the government, they had to back away. So NDTV has been a consistent target, and now, of course, there is news of the channel being bought over by a businessman who is, you know, close, not just close, he was an active member of the Bharatiya Janata Party's 2014 uh, election strategy and has served in the past as uh, an officer on special duty for Pramod Mahajan. So, uh, uh, and he owns Spicejet, so he's a kind of uh, a big corporate player. And, uh, you know, th there, is, there is talk of NDTV, whose financial position is somewhat parlous, being bought over by Ajay Singh. So perhaps what the government couldn't accomplish through raids and intimidation will be easier done uh, uh, through this. So, but, but nevertheless, the use of the use of official agencies remains a threat. Uh, I mentioned echoes of what is happening today uh, uh, in, in terms of what was the state of play when uh, BJP was last in power. You will recall when Tehelka broke the story of uh, arms, uh, corruption and arms deals through their sting operation. Shortly after the promoters of um, Tehelka, which was then a website, were raided and a whole bunch of cases were foisted on them. Nothing came of those cases, finally. But the kind of harassment that the promoters were subjected to ensured that the website collapsed and died. And that happened during the time Vajpayee was, was prime minister. Uh, so there is, in a, in a way, uh, a, 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 you know, precedent for this, this kind of pressure and harassment. And from what we've seen, uh, this government certainly uh, you know, will not shy away from using or misusing uh, investigating agencies, income tax authorities, and various other uh, bodies as a, as a way of putting pressure. Um, apart from the um, you know, physical attacks, apart from raids, you have officially sanctioned trolls, trolling, as a, as a means of... Uh, this is, again, something quite new uh, in the media. Perhaps even three years ago, four years ago, we wouldn't have uh, you know, had to deal with this kind of problem. But you have uh, a phalanx or an army of uh, people active on social media, many of whom are actually affiliated to a part of you know, IT cells of the ruling party and uh, who are uh, uh, pushed out in an organized and orchestrated fashion to go after particular individuals or to, uh, you know, when a, when a particular news item is trending, to somehow intervene in Twitter and get an opposite trend uh, to to uh, to supersede that, and um, many of these people resort to the targeted abuse and harassment of journalists who are seen as critical of the government. Recently, there was an expose done by Alt News, which is one of the websites in India that actually is dedicated to 
exposing uh, fake news and a lot of uh, some of these hidden, uh, the, the manner in which IT and social media is misused by, by, um, by the government. So Alt News reported how um, one of the guys who has been, ta who has been targeting Ravish, who is a leading anchor and an independent-minded journalist uh, for NDTV India, the Hindi channel, how this chappy is actually linked to uh, the BJP in Gujarat, is uh, somebody who is uh, followed by Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Twitter, and um, has relations with Amit Shah, with other, other BJP ministers. So there's a sense in which, and earlier too, evidence had surfaced, for example, when some of these people celebrated on Twitter the murder of Gauri Lankesh, and it turned out that they were, again, being followed by the Prime Minister. So one can argue, okay, fine, you know, um, Prime Minister is not responsible for the tweets of those he follows, but one wonders, I mean, in no other democratic country would you have a situation like this where uh, the head of state would openly follow uh, or be even remotely associated with these kinds of Twitter handles. And yet, uh, Mr. Modi has this kind of relationship with them. Uh, once in a while, I think on two occasions, he's invited people who he follows who f uh, on Twitter to the Prime Minister's office for, for a cup of tea. So there is a sense in which a lot of this harassment and trolling of uh, media and media personalities has uh, sanctioned from, from the very top. You, in addition, have the use of uh, criminal defamation and the IT Act, the potential use of these laws. India is, again, perhaps the last of uh, the democracies in the world to still have criminal defamation on its statute books. There was a move to have it struck down, which the Supreme Court didn't accept last year. Um, uh, and the, you know, essentially criminal defamation, which adds, a new, adds an additional layer beyond civil defamation, uh, is a lever that's, that politicians use, private companies use, various other uh, powerful individuals are able to use in order to lean on journalists, in order to lean on media. The IT Act, um, so far the government hasn't used the IT Act openly against uh, any media portal yet, but the manner in which police agencies across the country are uh, interpreting or misinterpreting the provisions of the IT Act. For example, one of, you know, Article 66 was famous, right? This was the, this was the section, uh, not Article, Section 66 was famous of the IT Act. This was the section which um, allowed the police to arrest those two women in uh, Bombay after Bal Thakur's death when they said that uh, Bombay, is morning, Bombay is quiet not because people are sad but because they've been forced to, forced to, uh, to mourn the death of Thackeray. Uh, so uh, that section which was worded in a very elastic way was read down by the Supreme Court and essentially struck off. But section 67 remains, which prohibits the electronic transmission of obscene or lascivious material, quote unquote. And since there isn't really any definition in the IT Act for what is obscene and what is lascivious, now th there is a sense in which we know what this means. Uh, you know, material that is calculated to deprave, these are again vague terms, but there are legal precedents for what these terms mean in practice. But uh, the police have interpreted lascivious or um, you know, obscene material to include morphed photographs of leaders, uh, to include poems that are, that are derogatory and which may, had they been printed in a magazine or in a newspaper, uh, might not have, but, but would certainly not fall foul of the law, let me put it that way. They've used this to, to criminalize or attempt to criminalize people who've posted things on Facebook. They've attempted to uh, charge people for liking things on Facebook, for tweeting, for retweeting. So there's a sense in which the IT Act is um, still provides the police with uh, the ability to harass people on social media. So far, the bulk of their targets have been individual social media users, but it's very clear that by defining and treating the law in this elastic fashion, uh, in the future, this could easily be used to go against um, you know, electronic or digital media uh, uh, platforms as well. Um, you then have the use of advertising by the government as a way of penalizing uh, media outlets. In Kashmir, for example, Kashmir Times, which is a critical, independent-minded uh, newspaper published from Jammu, has been denied, and this is not with this government alone, for the last 10, 15 years, 
simply because they report human rights violations, they, they don't report in a stenographic fashion what the police or what the army say. So Kashmir Times has been denied uh, any, any official advertising. So, you know, say the government is acquiring land or, you know, th there are certain statutory ads that they are required to put in the newspapers and they will not give ads to Kashmir Times, which is a major uh, blow to, um, to these papers which subsist on advertising for their, for their revenue. And this is, you know, this may not matter to national level newspapers like the Times of India or the Hindu, but at the state level, to starve a newspaper of public advertising is essentially to uh, make them financially unviable. And this is also a lever that the governments use to put pressure. Uh, if we move away from official forms of pressure, you have uh, increasing, the increasing use of slaps, strategic lawsuits against uh, public participation. Josie Joseph of the Hindu wrote a book on jet airways and was slapped with the 100 crore uh, uh, defamation suit by uh, Mr. Naresh Goyal and, and jet airways. Uh, we at The Wire have one, we have three, three cases against us, one by Adani for 100 crore in Bhuj, in a Bhuj court, uh, two lawsuits by Rajiv Chandrasekhar, who is this uh, weapons manufacturing member of parliament who is part of NDA, part of the National Democratic Alliance, two cases from him, each worth 20 crore in a court in Bangalore, and uh, one defamation, one civil come criminal defamation case by Subhash Chandra, who was, a, who was an MP and head of the Z Group, uh, which is a media, itself a media company. Uh, so we have a case from him in a court in Ezol, uh, Mizoram, which is, I think he wants 10 crore in damages. So, so this is all, and these are all frivolous cases that we will, we will fight and we will defeat. But the idea is that you embroil the media, you threaten, you browbeat, you bully. Um, Paranjoy Gohar Thakurta, when he wrote, uh, who was incidentally for the Adani case also, so he and he, uh, uh, as a result of the article he wrote for Economic and Political Weekly, which cost him his job. So we re-ran re that article in The Wire, so the case is against Paranjoy and us. But Paranjoy, earlier when he wrote a book on, on the fight between the two Ambani brothers called The Gas Wars, it was a self-published book, and uh, he uh, again received uh, threats of a lawsuit, which finally the Ambanis didn't translate into, uh, into an actual case. But oftentimes, it's the threat of, as, as we saw in the case of EPW, that the very you know, idea of sending a, a legal threat is enough to get people to back down. And we're seeing increasingly the use of uh, these kinds of lawsuits by, by, uh, by, the, by large corporates, which is uh, you know, emerging as a serious form of, of pressure. Caravan Magazine is another independent publication that has been harassed by uh, these kinds of cases uh, in the past and continues to be, uh, continues to be so, but you know beyond the external forms of pressure, which are you know pressure pressure that the government can exert, pressure that private companies exert, it's the it's really the internal you know I, I don't want to uh, it's important that we not uh, exaggerate the extent to which the rot in the Indian media today is externally imposed. There is an external there is an element of external imposition. There is an element of fear of what the government or private companies, big companies can do. But a lot of what is rotten, a lot of what is bad, uh, is something that has essentially uh, been generated from within uh, um, media organizations themselves. And I think understanding this is key to uh, dealing with uh, or analyzing um, you know, the, the current position and the future, future trajectory of, of the Indian media. And it's really the, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I will throw at you three or four examples of, um, you know, from the last month, literally, the last two months, of um, things that are wrong with, you know, internally, that have to do with, um, you know, of course, a combination of, there is, there is external pressure or external suggestion that operates too, but what is it that makes the largest media houses in, in the country accept suggestions or accept pressure or accept things that the government or somebody outside uh, you know, would say. The uh, recent termination of the Hindustan Times editor, editor's position, job, for example, Bobby Ghosh, brought to India with a lot of fanfare literally a year ago by, or a year and a half ago by, by the Hindustan Times proprietor uh, and essentially terminated at very short notice by Shobhana Bhartia. The decision to ask him to leave came shortly after the meeting she had with the Prime Minister, 
where we know from our sources, and we wrote about this, the issue of uh, Hindustan Times' coverage and Bobby Ghosh's citizenship, which is an alibi that the government was using um, because there is no illegality involved in a foreign editor editing a newspaper. They know it. But nevertheless, this was raised as an issue. And, um, and Shobhna Bhartia, you know, essentially went along and the uh, newspaper got rid of him. Um, Times of India recently, lots of examples of stories being pulled down. It's not clear that, you know, at what, from, from where instructions come or uh, a demand comes, but there was a story that they ran recently in their Jaipur edition, which was a criticism, which was, which showed the Prime Minister's insurance scheme for farmers in bad light. It's called the Pradhan Mantri Kisan Bhima Yojana. And uh, it essentially showed how, you know, the scheme was not working and that farmers were getting ripped off. The story runs in the Jaipur edition of the Times of India. It's liked enough within the internal editorial structure for uh, the Delhi paper to want to run the story. So, the, so they asked for changes and, and improvements so that they will run it in, in the Delhi edition. And then what happens is that the story never runs in Delhi. Not, on, not only does it not run in Delhi, it is pulled down from the website. It vanishes. And uh, queries to editors as to why this happened draw a blank. Nobody is willing to take responsibility. And uh, you know, it's not as if the ha this hasn't happened in the past. This has happened before. Um, one of the, there was recently a leak of a WhatsApp message in which showed how uh, the executive editor of the Times of India was lobbying with the finance minister to, uh, to have an income tax official posted abroad. And uh, you know, the question arises that if, if, if the editor of Times of India is, has a comfort level with the finance minister to demand or to lobby for uh, uh, posting for somebody abroad, you wonder what kind of leverage or what kind of comfort operates the other way around. Uh, you know, so we presume the finance minister also feels comfortable enough to say, move that story, move this guy, kill that story, et cetera. So it's, you know, and, and when, again, when we raise these things in the public domain, there's never been a tradition of any public discussion of these sorts of things, but uh, at the wire, we don't, you know, we, we don't balk at these sorts of things. So we, we've been writing about it. And um, we actually asked the Times of India's proprietor, the HT's proprietor and editors, you know, please give an explanation for this. And they, they, they don't have explanations for it. And they just prefer not to answer. But uh, what is it that makes me big media houses, right? We're talking, I mean, Times of India is a company that um, <clears throat> has a bottom line of probably 1,000, 1,500 crore. It's a massive company. Uh, the English language Times of India is the largest circulating English paper in the world. They have a near monopoly in print, on television, radio, because they own Radio Mirchi. They have interests in the movie business. What is it that would make Times of India uh, or Hindustan Times, which is also a large player, vulnerable in this way? Why would, why would a Dainik Jagran, which is a Hindi paper, big Hindi paper, why would they want to consciously break the law during the Uttar Pradesh elections and run an opinion poll when the law says you can't, that shows BJP leading? Uh, what is it that would want to make them run these kinds of risks? What is it that would want to make them uh, curry favor with the government over the ruling party? Uh, this is really the uh, fundamental question. And it has to do, in my view, with the nature of the business model and the fact that the business model of Indian media, of big Indian media, is breaking down in ways that are very, very damaging to editorial integrity. And in a nutshell, that business model consists of not wanting to charge readers or viewers anything for the product, for the news that they consume, and to shift the entire, to collect the entire revenue. So you pay for your media uh, expenses, your news gathering expenses and your delivery expenses, not by charging readers a fee or a subscription price or anything of that sort, but by collecting advertising. And when advertising is not, so this has been the, this is the model around the world, except that in the West, newspaper revenues perhaps rarely dipped below 60%. Uh, if we look at subscriptions, maybe 50-50. Uh, in India, in the 50s, we know from uh, a study that, that a parliamentary committee uh, conducted that advertising was about 50-55% of revenue. Today, advertising for newspapers constitutes 95 to 96%. If you consider that the cost of producing each copy of the paper is more than what 
they are able to recover from a sale. So in other words, there's a negative marginal revenue. They lose, they lose 15 rupees for every copy they sell, actually. The contribution of advertising is probably 120 or 130% of revenue. So, uh, so, so you're essentially recouping your expenses through, through advertising. And this obviously has uh, an impact on your coverage because it gives advertisers a disproportionate say. But as media turns increasingly digital, which is what is happening, even in an India, even in an, a market like India, which is a late entrant into digital media, but the speed with which things are changing, um, smartphone ownership and penetration, data plans. I think two or three years from now, because of Reliance Geo, 3G or 4G is going to be the norm across for, for most owners of smartphones, and, and they will be 80 to 90% of the population. So just as in the telecom space, people move from having no telephone to having a mobile phone, right? So, so there was, the bulk of people skipped the landline phase. Bulk of Indian media consumers will skip the phase of reading newspapers, I dare say even watching TV, and will be consuming media entirely digitally and entirely on their phone. And whatever the wider sociological you know, implications of this, let's leave that aside. But what this means for the revenue of news companies is, uh, is something very, very dramatic because advertising yields, when it comes to the, the amount of real estate you have on a, on a mobile phone, tend to be very, 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 very low. So the idea that a company like Times of India could generate enough advertising revenue from mobile phone advertising, enough to pay for the news gathering expenses of its vast empire, seems uh, very hard to, to stomach. They will not be able to do it. And um, this is forced, and, and you know, newspapers, me, big media houses know that they have to move away and look, look for other sources of revenue. And what they tend to do is to get involved in businesses that are outside of media. Times of India has been doing this for a long time. Uh, they have something called MediaNet initially, which was a form of trading new space, favorable new space for, for money. And that has evolved now to something called private treaties, where they sign essentially equity deals. So if you're a, if you're a large advertiser, Let's say you are a company like India Bulls, which, which started off as a stockbroker and then got into real estate. So a company like India Bulls will sign a deal with, with Bennett Coleman for coverage, for, for advertising. Officially, it will be for advertising, in exchange for which Times of India will pick up a small stake in, uh, in India Bulls. And uh, there, there may or may not be unwritten understandings about favorable coverage. We saw a recent example of an, an, excuse me, an Economic Times editorial on the uh, scandal surrounding a private builder called the JP Group. Now, this is a group that uh, has been um, quite close to the BJP in the past and even now. And has uh, several housing projects around Delhi where they've essentially ripped off middle class buyers by collecting money up front and not delivering on the flats that they promised to build and no hope of delivering either. And then they went and, of course, the entire project was being done by a subsidiary, which then declared bankruptcy. It had no other assets, so the home, the prospective flat owners were left high and dry. They went to court. The Supreme Court, in a rare decision, essentially told the company that uh, we are going to hold all your uh, affiliated companies also to account, so you can't, you cannot, you know, insulate yourself just by declaring bankruptcy of this one company. So you have Economic Times writing an editorial, criticizing the Supreme Court for for this judgment, and then it turns out that that JP Group is one of the groups of which Economic Times has has a private treaty. So so JP so Times owns uh, one or two percent in various subsidiary companies of the JP Group. So so you have these kinds of conflicts of interest, which are very much part of the media landscape now, and to pretend that this does not affect coverage is, uh, is really to, uh, to live in a fool's paradise. Uh, I want to, uh, since I have five minutes left, just address the question that I, uh, that I threw at you before I started, which is that 
um, sorry, before I do that, what what this you know the the increasing tendency for Indian media companies to have secondary or tertiary business interests uh, is not only because they are looking for additional sources of revenue and profitability at a time when advertising is being squeezed, but this also makes them vulnerable to not only changes in the economy, because if you are, say, Jagran, or, and you have a power company, or if you're Bennett Coleman, so one of the reasons why the Times of India group is exposed today, or is, is vulnerable, is because they have a large project in Uttar Pradesh called Bennett University, a private university to be built on land that has been given to them by the Uttar, Uttar Pradesh government. It was given by the previous government, but there is a fear that all clearances haven't been granted, so they're, they're dreading the prospect of Yogi Adityanath one day writing them a letter saying that, well, you didn't get your environmental clearance done yet, and you forgot to ask these villagers for their clearance, so we're stopping your project. So there's, a, you know, essentially these secondary and tertiary interests that you develop leave you, uh, uh, you know, leaves you completely open to forms of pressure that, uh, you know, governments like to exert because you will, they say, we're not targeting Times of India. We are targeting Bennett University. Uh, you know, so so uh, the more exposed you are as an as a media company in terms of other interests, uh, the greater it is, greater likelihood that you are uh, you know going to face pressure or be vulnerable to pressure from the government. But I want to address this question that I started with, which is that okay, so all of these things, all of these ills that I've described in one way or the other, private ownership, dependence on advertising, all of this exists in the U.S. too, <clears throat> to lesser or greater degree. So why is it that the U.S. media? has been much more aggressive and more independent in dealing with the Trump administration than the Indian media. And I want to offer two or three, two or three hypotheses. First, um, <clears throat> it is my sense that um, if you look at Trump versus Modi in terms of wider political economy at the national level, the uh, US corporate sector is <clears throat> really very divided. And if, if at all there is a consens consensual position in the corporate sector, it would be that Trump is pretty much bad news. And even if that's not a consensual position, but a major section of US industry uh, would be reacting very, very negatively to, um, uh, to the Trump phenomenon, to his election, to his policies. And that, to my mind, creates space, creates a comfort zone for big media to echo those concerns in India. If you look at how Modi got elected, there was near consensual, sort of there was near unanimity among all big, and I, I wrote about this in a seminar in 2014, about the shift from the Congress to the BJP that we saw from 2012 onwards of all your big Indian companies, big corporate sector. And that, you know, e even though there is irritation in some sectors today with, with the whimsicality of some of his decisions, demonetization, for example, but broadly speaking, uh, Indian corporate, corporate India is still uh, sold on the idea that Modi is, is the best uh, solution for the Indian economy. And uh, I think that this acts as a dampener for, uh, for at least the plurality of views uh, in, the, in the Indian media and certainly for uh, the appetite of uh, uh, media companies to do certain kinds of stories or to have certain kinds of debates. Second, um, State institutions in the United States, which you know have evolved with a fair degree of autonomy and integrity over 200 years, where today it's much more difficult for you know when when Trump is pushing a certain agenda item, the uh, there are lots of areas where you where he can actually be where he's facing pushback, so you so you can have a decision on. Um, prohibiting the entry of Muslims from different countries. The first point of pushback came from within the State Department. It's a different matter that they were overruled. But in India, uh, you have a situation where, and we wrote about this two days ago, the MEA puts out a book to celebrate Deen Dayal Upadhyay. And this has never happened. An unsigned book where they say that BJP is the only alternative for India. And where there's a facile equation of Hinduness with Indian, with Indian, with Bharatiyata. Uh, so the, and, and when we approached retired uh, IFS people that, look, you, you need to take a stand on this. Uh, and so these are people with no, you know, they retired 10 years ago, 15 years ago. 
And out of the 15 people we contacted, only three or four people were willing to speak. So, so that lack of institutional, um, you know, autonomy or pride or you know what have you, which you know I think, uh, when it comes to the functioning say of investigative agencies in India, uh, you know, so the CBI uh, is very very unlikely if if it receives an instruction from the government that you go after NDTV, uh, the CBI is completely unlikely to say no, we won't, or to wonder about the legality or the implications or a future you know, uh, a future probe by somebody, uh, unlike in the United States where uh, these things are much more harder to, they're more hard to affect directly. Uh, so I think that the nature of state institutions and the way in which uh, investigative agencies, the courts, you know, the, the pushback against Trump's uh, entry program came from a court in, I think, Washington State and then in Hawaii. Uh, in India, you'd be lucky to have a pushback at only at the Supreme Court level, or maybe High Court of Bombay and Delhi. And even then, the government has, so, so you had uh, two years ago, Justice Shakdar in the Delhi High Court who said that the government's attempt to deny, to stop a Greenpeace activist from going to the UK, Priya Pillai, that this decision to stop her was illegal. Two months later, this judge is transferred from Delhi High Court and sent off to Madras. So, so the levers of, you know, the, the executive's ability to uh, manage every state institution, uh, I think also uh, becomes a factor which makes it uh, uh, more likely that the media would prefer to keel over and go along with the, with the program of, 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 of the ruling party than to contest it. And the last point really, and again, this you know, doesn't make me very happy to say this as, as an Indian journalist, but I think that the level of institutional integrity within media organizations is very low the degree of professionalism, the degree to which people take pride in, uh, in journalism as a craft, uh, and um, you know, I would be willing to uh, stand, stand up to uh, dodgy instructions given by an owner or an editor. Uh, you know, I think that that is also uh, something which separates US journalism today from Indian journalism, which is why I believe despite uh, many of the negative political economy factors operating in both countries. Um, what we see in India is much less of a fight, much less of a challenge. Uh, and it's uh, not a surprise that the, the challenge or the pushback to, uh, at least on the reporting front, on the, on the, on the news front, uh, is coming from you know, smaller players making use of uh, the internet, making use of digital, digital storytelling, and the fact that you don't need you know, the, uh, the reason we started The Wire as an as a online portal was because there are no entry barriers. So with very, virtually no investment, you, one can be up and running, and it becomes that much more difficult for somebody to, to tamp down on that coverage. So maybe digital, maybe social media, maybe these are the avenues through which the Indian media will find and amplify its voice in the, uh, in the coming months and years. But as of now, based on you know, trends, underlying trends, of uh, political economy and the business nature of the business model, the outlook as far as big media is concerned is not at all very optimistic. Thank you. Good, thank you so much. Um, the floor is open immediately for questions and comments. Uh, Anand, we have a microphone. Perhaps you'd um, uh, take control of that. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, is this recording? Oh, just recording. Okay. Yeah. Okay, fine. Um, thank you, Siddharth. Uh, you know, you're always, uh, well, you're, you're always, always very analytical, but you're lately getting more and more depressing. <laughs> but for, for good reason. But the, so the question that I, I, I have is this. It seems at some level, you talk about how it used to be and how, how we had an Im impression of a media that wasn't this way. And then you describe the sort of, the, the, the in, in, in great detail, the, 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 both the mediocrity, the, the selling out, the terror, all of the, uh, all of the various elements that you describe. So at some level, I think, what does it mean to, to, to think about uh, uh, 
an open media, an open, freer, uh, healthy media uh, that, that existed in India at some point, and boom, you have the absolute opposite, right? So it's, it's hard to actually understand that transition unless you, can you trace for us a little bit sort of what institutional weaknesses you think you know, could have led to this? Because otherwise, it just seems um, such a reversal um, in, in your story. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the two, I would say the two uh, institutional weaknesses that have developed over the last 20 or 30 years, uh, one is the, on the economic side, which is uh, the manner in which the business model, the underlying business model of media has, you know, it, uh, is primarily responsible actually, because the, you know, it stands to reason that if, if the more you are dependent on just your readers, right, as a, uh, for your money making, the greater is the likelihood that you will be loyal and responsive to them and to them alone, and be able to withstand pressures that force you to move away from that. Right? So, uh, so the fact is that over the last 20 years, Indian media houses have become less and less dependent and hence less and less accountable to their readership and viewership. And it's other, it's other interests that are essentially, that have clouded in and uh, on whom media is financially dependent. So, so, so this is uh, not something which happened after 2014. It's been happening for a, for a longish period of time. And uh, I mentioned you know, uh, the Times of India group and it's it, the evolution of some of its business practices with MediaNet, which is a form of paid news. So all of this has made media vulnerable. And uh, I think the current setup has managed to see, latch onto those and, you know, use those vulnerabilities in a very efficient manner. And the second institutional uh, factor is the changing nature of, you know, when I, when I say that, Indian media institutions lack internal integrity, right? So there is, so uh, you'll be, you'd be hard pressed to find a full-fledged editor in any media organization today. And by, by a full-fledged editor, I mean somebody who is responsible for deciding what gets covered, how it'll get covered, who will cover it, uh, and what kind of resources will be devoted to covering it, right? So, in very, and this and this has been the case now for the last fifteen or twenty years, where the Times of India did away. So, the editor lost the autonomy to make hires, to decide. Uh, uh, I mean, I remember when I wanted to uh, back in 1999, I had an invitation um, f to speak at a conference in the Hague. And this was when NATO was bombing Yugoslavia. And I told my editor that, look, you know, I'm going to The Hague anyway. So, you know, Budapest is a train journey away and then by, by road to Belgrade and I'll spend a week there, cover, cover the war, war for us. Hardly cost, uh, you know, total, I said, I'll do the whole thing within 800 or $1,000. That's hardly 40,000 rupees. He was excited, he said, great. But then he said, wait, I have to, uh, this is something only the boss. So a decision to spend $800 had to be cleared by Vinit Jain, who's the owner of the company. Uh, and that was, you know, Times of India. And there are lots of other examples of, you know, so, so, so the, and this is something quite harmless. I mean, when it comes to contentious stories or difficult issues, editors have ceded ground uh, or never, never had that ground, in the, never had that space, in the, you know, in the first place. So I think that uh, all of this has made, made things much easier. So you, you don't have, uh, you know, there, there is no one editor who takes pride and, uh, what goes into the into her paper and is able to take a stand and say, look, this is not allowed. This is or I will not air this. Uh, and you know, decisions. Uh, again, this is anecdotal, but shortly after um, Amit Shah was cleared by a CBI court in the Sorabuddin and uh, Prajapat uh, Kosarbi murder case. I'm talking now December 2014. I recall calling up uh, a friend of mine who worked, who was actually high up in the channel, and I said, look, you, you should do, have a discussion on this. And he scheduled a discussion, and management canceled it. Uh, so, you know, so, so and, and, the, and management was able to cancel it because uh, that's the way these companies are structured, and that's the way they've been for the last 10, 15 years. So I think that what has happened is, has, you know, they've taken, a, I think this government has taken advantage has, of what has evolved, so to that extent, it's not, it's not sudden, 
but even so uh, what they are doing is really quite new like nobody in the past took things to such an extent where a story after it is published vanishes from a website like i have like we are collecting these things we have like six seven examples in the last three years and this never happened before and i, I mean i've been in the media for 15 16 years we never saw this degree of of uh, control from outside i mean, i presume this is outside because nobody will say where or who is doing this but uh, um, the fact that they can get away with this and there's no you know there's no disquiet within within these organizations tells you how deep the rot is good i have many people on my list so we'll collect a few questions uh, first subir then srila and then sunil yeah I, uh, my question uh, thanks. Uh, I think part what you just said uh, partly answers one of my questions, which is, was this not an earlier moment, late 80s, early 90s, when the editors ceded uh, control over to, to management for the kind of decisions? But also, I mean, to what extent is this actually quite Modi-specific, in the sense that if you look at him from 2007-8 within Gujarati media, uh, then you have Dainik Bhaskar, Dainik Jagran, Economic Times, HT, they all kind of begin to talk quite a lot about the Modi model, the Gujarat model. And in fact, even NDTV in 2012, 13, etc., they gave a free pass on the Gujarat model, as if it was an already established thing. I've watched programs there when, you know, it was just taken for granted that this is the best model in the country. And I've not really found a very satisfactory answer as to why the switch happened before even you know, Modi came to power and before some of the dynamics that you're talking about, you know, happened. And in addition to news media, you also have, I mean, right now, in fact, while checking, tw you know, Twitter during the break, I find that you now have a time traveler who is telling the news channel India Today, uh, India TV, sorry, Z India, uh, he is doing a uh, sort of uh, seance to find where Hanipreet is, okay? So the degree of irrationality you know, that your mainstream television channel now has Ashwatthama comes to this temple, that kind of thing, uh, or the religious channels like Astha or Sanskar, which have all the Babas who are also political Babas, they, it kind of creates a much wider spectrum for Hindutva politics to unfold than if we were just talking about the news channel. So do you see that as, as at all relevant, which yeah. is that it's not just the news channels which are d doing, you know, Kaun bane, Banega Karodpati. Now there are 10 questions to do with uh, recognize this voice, this is Smriti Rani's voice, okay? Uh, which BJP chief minister is known as Mama, etc. So you have a much uh, deeper kind of cultural politics supporting the BJP than just the news channels. And I'm just wondering if yeah. you want to comment on that as well. Okay. Uh, Srila. Thanks. Uh, so just a small question about the role of social media in all this, because obviously one assumes that the social uh, that social media is playing a very, very important, agential, productive role. But I just saw a recent report that suggested, and I think I've seen this elsewhere, that actually internet usage in India is not is far more overstated. And maybe, I, I think it said it's only 13% in terms of the rural population. So I just wondered if you could comment on that. I found your comparison between the U.S. and um, uh, India quite provocative in, in, in a certain way. And in a certain way, 2014, you know, uh, f you know f was at the sort of forefront of what we get in Brexit and then Trump coming later. And, uh, you know, a lot of commentators have focused on this sort of fundamental irrationality of this. So I'm wondering, you know, uh, how important are emotions um, uh, to what journalists do or, or, or what journalists should be doing and what they are doing and how, how, you know, how has it become more of a uh, uh, sort of integral to uh, the way people experience uh, media, whether it's social media or television um, uh, yeah. and so on and so forth. You know? uh, so anyway, that's my question about emotions, basically. Should I answer this one? Yeah. Okay. And, um, the internet uh, penetration, that's a good question. We don't really have hard data on this. I mean, there are different, um, one figure says 300 million, one figure says 400 million. Most of the figures that that have these large numbers, most of the most of this data that has large numbers, like 300, 400 million, have a very, you know, the definition of an internet user is somebody who may have visited a web page once in the month, once in the past month, kind of a thing, right? So I would take, I would say the figures are uh, in terms of regular internet usage, maybe 60 to 80 million. But the problem with this figure is and. 
you know, it used, it used to be said in Indonesia a few years ago that internet meant Facebook, right? P people did not know what is internet, they knew Facebook. They said, if you ask them, are you on internet? They said, no, but they were all on Facebook because they had, you know, essentially free basics and so they were accessing, they had easy access to Facebook. In India, it's not Facebook, it's WhatsApp. That people, so in other words, uh, a lot of people with even a, you know, with a smartphone and a basic, even a 2G connection are able to access content, which is kind of, it's not exactly SMS. Uh, so it, it is, you know, some of these are links that you click on, but even if you don't, you get a, you know, you can get a whole video, which is uh, eight megabyte long, which you can download quite easily. So uh, it's very hard to define content now as that this is internet, this is not internet. And I would say that if we, if we include WhatsApp in internet coverage, internet use, the numbers are probably pretty large. And we, and you know, there is anecdotal evidence from kasbas and small towns of uh, you know WhatsApp messages creating, you know, playing havoc actually with uh, uh, at, a, at a local level. So we know at least of two recent communal flare-ups: one in West Bengal, one in Uttar Pradesh. Where uh, and I think the Uttar Pradesh one involved a flare-up in a village that stemmed from a WhatsApp message that a, a, lo a local guy had posted somewhere in Maharashtra. So you know there are interesting ways in which you know the boundaries of geography have have been erased, but it's not quite. People aren't going. You know, it's not they're not using Twitter or Facebook, but just a WhatsApp message. So I I would say that the impact is great and it's going to increase. And the I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that we're going to have reliable numbers, but it's fair to assume that um, even in rural areas today, um, you know, you have digital "quote unquote" information that is being disseminated, and we know from the BJP's electoral strategy that uh, they are looking to use mobile data, mobile telephony, and the use of WhatsApp groups to send their message far and wide. So they, I think the the penetration is pretty uh, is, is quite large. Um, uh, the question on, uh, you know, Subir's question. You see, 2012, 20, prior to 2014, every single channel, every, I mean, media was central to the BJP's campaign because the great victory of Modi was to erase the idea that he was twiddling his thumbs while genocide was happening in his state and I'm being charitable here. Uh, so to erase that idea and to instead have this idea that he's a great, because you know, that what could be a worse example of administration, right? Then you're a CM and 1200 people or 2000 people get killed in your, in your state. And I'm not even talking about your personal involvement or allegations of personal involvement. So somehow that image of being what should have been an example of bad, administ terrible administration gets transformed into Gujarat model and the entire media was complicit in this, including NDTV. Because as I said, there was consensus among Indian big business that we are sick and tired of Manmohan. And I have a, I mean, my analysis of this really has to do with, you know, corruption in Manmohan's time was not that they favored, not that they did not favor big business and Modi is favoring them, but that it was so chaotic and disorganized that they were cherry picking who among the big companies would benefit and who wouldn't. So in 2G, 2G is a classic case. So Unitech, uh, you know, two, three companies uh, get cherry picked for getting the best benefits out of it. That created a huge amount of resentment among the rest of the telecoms players. So for a variety of reasons, the entire big Indian sort of business class switched loyalties and said we want Modi and the media reflected that. Uh, so this idea of Gujarat model being a great thing was all was sold by them. Uh, the uh, you know Modi's media practice. What is specific about Modi is disdain for the media, refusal to engage. So he will not take questions. He will not he will not uh, put himself in a position where you will ever be able to throw an unscripted question at him. And uh, so so this is so that's what. You know, uh, they used to attack Manmohan Singh as Mon, Mon Mohan Singh, silent, you know, man who's silent. Manmohan Singh, in the 10 years he was PM, addressed three large formal press conferences at Vigyan Bhavan. 
and innumerable uh, uh, chota or minor press conferences on his uh, aeroplane on the way back from all his foreign trips when he took when he took journalists with him. So he must have been in at least 50 or 60 situations uh, that you could call press conferences. Uh, Modi has avoided even one. And uh, uh, for him, it's strictly one-way communication. Uh, and you know, uh, you have to say it's, it's, it's working for him. Because even when uh, you know, the journalists, there was this horrible picture a few years ago when journalists got to celebrate Diwali with him. And instead of using that opportunity to ask questions, they were all taking selfies uh, with the guy, right? So, so this is unfortunately, uh, this is the situation. So this is, you know, Modi, uh, th th that's the way he handles media. The question you asked about the wider cultural politics and these channels, I mean, we've always had superstition being pervaded through in the garb of news. India, you know, Rajat Sharma's India TV would often have Bhut Preet and, you know, ghosts and... Uh, uh, Marriage of Nag or Nagin ki ka vivah, you know, all the rubbish like this. Uh, so I don't, you know, I, I I don't know to what extent this. I mean, sociologists in the audience would be better placed to analyze w what that does for you know mass culture. But you've had equivalents. You know, people have traced some of the Hindutva you know frenzy to um, uh, Ramanand Sagar's Ramayan and Durdarshan. I don't know how how valid that is or not. But what is certainly true is that. Uh, Apart from the obvious superstition and mumbo jumbo, a lot of anchors, like you know, during demonetization, uh, top channels floated this nonsense about how the 2,000 rupee note has a microchip in it, yes. which you even if you bury in uh, you know under uh, 80 feet of earth, the satellite will be able to identify and how brilliant this is of Modi. So you know, uh, a lot of fake news is being put out, and I find that more alarming. I mean, it's. So this is a, okay. So this is an example of crazy fake news, but uh, the Times Now kind of fake news, where they pick up on, a, they'll say we've received an audio clip of something, and they'll play this clip. You don't know what its provenance is, and later on it may turn out to be completely fabricated. But they will have a whole two days discussion as to how Muslims are so bad, and I think that's what is uh, uh, particularly troubling. And I'm sure this has an impact in terms of making the, uh, you know, uh, in terms of poisoning the atmosphere and. Uh, uh, so your question on how important are our emotions, you know, I, I didn't follow U.S. media coverage very closely uh, in, in, during the campaign, but what I find problematic about Indian uh, big media today, and you know, the, particularly these right-wing nationalist channels, is that they have erased any difference between views and news. And I find this problematic even in print. That uh, you know, I think that every every reporter or editor has her opinion, and you know, you, you know, she's entitled to it, or he, you know, he's entitled to it, and but there's a way that you express it, and certainly in a news report, keeping adjectives out, you know, if, if at all you're providing perspective, sourcing that perspective properly, uh, these are all you know, uh, part and parcel of professional journalism, and all of these principles have been thrown to the wind in uh, you know in, in in these in the channels that I named, and others like them. And so I find this deeply problematic, that uh, you know when the, when the journalist gets carried away and uh, you know emotional slash editorializing, as opposed to simply presenting uh, you know basic basic facts. Good. There's time for one last and final round of questions and comments. Uh, first, Anu. And then uh, yeah. Katinka, Ajanta. Can I? Can I ask? Yeah. You as well? Okay. Yeah. In that case, we and Kavita. I'll give very short answers. Okay, and very short <laughs> questions, please. Thank you. I could ask quickly. I guess it goes off. Um, it's actually it's two quick questions. I'll ask them very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so first, regarding regarding the U.S., I wonder if the more interesting or useful comparison would be with the period after 9-11 and the run-up to the Iraq War, when uh, media revenues were at their, it was as flush as it had ever been, but they completely rolled over for Bush. Include, everyone's forgotten this now, but including the New York Times and New Yorker, everyone supported Bush and the, the war um, in terms of American media autonomy and state autonomy, because all these sort of state agencies rolled over, rolled over for Bush at that time as well. Um, second, uh, thank you for this very, the very useful analysis of sort of the changing 
financial models of the media houses, um, it's very useful to think about what's going on. But it, it occurs to me that none of this would matter so much if these newspapers and magazines weren't so, newspapers and TV channels, sorry, weren't so popular. Um, if Republic TV and Times Now and the Times of India weren't the most watched and read. Um, so I just wonder if you could speculate about why they're more popular than The Wire, or The Hindu, or NDTV. I think my question takes off from Anand's a little bit. Um, so I, I think you know you've presented a very dark, uh, depressing. I think, as Raka said, vision of what's going on, and we're all very concerned about it. But I also want to take you back to that moment where you said that um, Republic TV and so forth think of themselves as outliers. And the fact that there has been a kind of expansion, and I just want to ask you about sort of English language media as opposed to, you know, media in other languages, and the way in which there has also been a very different kind of public sphere that one is contending with now. So there is a way in which, you know, English language media has to account for a kind of detour and then come back and, in a sense, process what's, what's gone on. And maybe that's part of the... Um, you know, that, that's what stands behind these last two questions about affect and passionate attachments, uh, but also, you know, how to explain this kind of popularity, because it seems to me that, um, and this is not perverse, I, I do want to say that, you know, if the, the people, which is what we've been talking about, is this kind of category that's a placeholder, well, the people can also be regressive and the people can also react and the people also have a completely different uh, either non-democratic or non-liberal understanding of what they're doing um, politically and in the public sphere. So how would we actually have an empathetic understanding of that while being deeply troubled at the same time? Um, and and I, I'm just very puzzled by how one would do this. Good, then Katinka. Hi, thank you for a very interesting uh, talk, even though it's very dark, as uh, somebody has already said. I'm interested in the um, corporatization aspect of what you were talking about. Um, as you know, that is something that has been discussed on a number of different levels, uh, and that's happening in field after field, not just in journalism, <coughs> but in the academia, in politics, in art, and it's happening all over. So if I were to ask you, what do you think is special about the Indian case and what do you think is m part of a more general trend that I would be curious to hear what you have to say? Adyanta? Yeah, um, just briefly, I mean, I think that, I mean, you mentioned that the Kargil war episode was a brief episode when you could say that this kind of ultra-nationalist consensus in the media. But I think there are some others also, like, uh, for instance, the coverage of most fake encounters and all of that as well, especially involving Muslims and all have been really, really skewed. And um, um, even and in states like Chhattisgarh and also, in a way, you know, all the newspapers there would most mostly toe the state line. But uh, one of the things I just wondered, in context of the U.S. Uh, anal uh, analogy, there's been a lot of talk in the U.S. about the post-truth kind of thing, where uh, social media is blamed for the uh, prol proliferation of fake news and all of that. But would you agree that in India, I feel it's my sense that it's the big media that is the main uh, culprit here in um, establishing uh, this, you know, these fake narratives and uh, emot em emotive, highly emot emot emotive, but extremely, you know, fake narratives built on complete lack of facts. And then sometimes it's fed by uh, social media, but sometimes it feeds social media in both ways. But that big media has a much greater reach there. Have I overlooked anyone? Okay. <laughs> That's Actually, it is question. exactly the same question. Um, I, mean, I was just sort of struck in your presentation, and per perhaps it's because you were trying to foreground the difference between the U.S. and India um, in terms of the political economy of the business model, right? Um, but th there, there was a sort of it was the it w one got the sense that it was political economic necessity rather than ideological allegiances um, that was really driving some of these transformations. And I wondered about ideological allegiances. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing is, sort of going off of Anu, I, 
and maybe Anand as well, I mean, does this, does this sort of capitulation to this business model um, and then the kind of ideological convergence with the Modi government that follows, um, is that equally true for other vernacular media? I mean, you talked about the, about, uh, the Hindi press, but what about um, other vernacular media that's not the Hindi press? I mean, does the scale mm -hmm. of the operation matter yeah. um, uh, yeah. to the extent to which there is this capitulation? Right. Yeah. Uh, Ojo just added himself to the list. Uh, but, mm. There's clearly a tension between the cultural agenda and the and the institute, the, the corporate agenda, right? And there are two different agendas, no? Even if you think of the BJP and if you think of the media. So I'm just wondering, how do the two come together in the scary way that they've come together? By cultural agenda, you mean of the BJP Hindutva, and RSS? Yeah, huh? the Hindutva okay. agenda much more yeah. than, right. yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, it used to be, uh, in, in 98, for example, in, uh, during Vajpayee's time, most media that supported Vajpayee and his initiatives were quite critical and quite wary of the cultural agenda, such as it manifested itself at that time. And there were examples because you had a crazy... HRD minister in the form of uh, Murli Manohar Joshi, who was pursuing all kinds of things. Uh, uh, but you know, media organizations made a distinction between the two. Under Modi, I would say that your big, when it comes to your big channels, there is uh, a tendency even to go along with the cultural agenda now, uh, and not just to support the political initiatives. For example, I was, I was shocked and appalled to see in Times Now, on Times Now channel, whole debate justifying pressure on a rationalist in Tamil Nadu and with the provocative question that are the rationalists provoking Hindus? This was a question the channel was putting out. <laughs> now you imagine that three rationalists have been killed uh, over the last three years. Gauri Lankesh has probably been killed by the same bunch of people. And here you have a man in Tamil Nadu, probably, you know, under the shadow of uh, ass impending assassination. And you can have a channel, essentially frame it like this, frame a question like this, or the same channel that anchor, um, uh, you know, after the Amarnath bus attack, where it turned out that uh, the driver who saved the passengers was Muslim. And uh, uh, but uh, no, that's not the point I wanted to make. Omar Abdullah, who was former chief minister, tweeted that the home minister of India should ensure the safety of Kashmiri students around the country so that there are no retaliatory attacks. Perfectly reasonable apprehension to have because these things have happened in the past. This channel went after Omar Abdullah and the national conference saying, are you saying that we Hindus, and he used that phrase, we Hindus, are like jihadists? So I would say that uh, increasingly with these big channels there, and the coverage of so-called Love Jihad, Times Now and Republic TV have embraced this uh, completely atrocious case from Kerala where an adult woman has been, her marriage has been annulled and uh, Hadia case. And the Supreme Court ordered a counter-terror investigation into you know, her marriage. Uh, and the two channels have embraced this uh, nonsense idea. Of uh, and you know held this out as and have tried to wheel out other examples of love jihad. So I would say that the the uh, corporate agenda and the cultural agenda we are seeing evidence which is disturbing to me of uh, media not being you know of actually embracing this uh, this agenda, which and sections of Hindi press always did it. So Jagran, Ujala, Dainik Bhaskar, in the to speak of uh, big newspapers on the Hindi belt have always uh, gone along with this kind of uh, this kind of thing and you see other other examples of you know, recent video clips surfaced of a bjp woman leader slapping a hindu girl for having a cup of tea with a muslim boy and so the the, the slap got wide coverage and you could say even uh, people were outraged and even the uh, north korean channels were constrained to say that this is a bad thing right mm -hmm. but there was no, no, none of them devoted any journalism to asking the police 
why was the Muslim boy in this incident, who was just having a cup of tea with this woman, charged with obscenity? So there is a police case and, uh, under Section 294 against this young man. Uh, and you know, so, so that was completely, so, so the, I think there is a sense in which the media is buying into uh, the cultural agenda, although I would say your large English papers don't. And uh, your, uh, you know, the, the non -go the non North Korean channels also will have pretty vigorous debates on some of these topics. Uh, but uh, that comes to your brings me to your question. Um, you know, ideological allegiance you see, say with ZTV, with India TV, where the owner, the editor are politically aligned with BJP. Right. So Subhash Chandra is a member of Raj Sabha supported by the BJP. Rajat Sharma makes no bones about his ideological and political affiliations. But um, you know, when it comes to, say, other channels, or say a paper like Hindu, like why would the editor of Hindu uh, say that, oh, no, uh, uh, in, in reference to my case, before, and this is before the last election, the new editor of the Hindu said that, well, one of the reasons we asked him to go was because he uh, was too critical of Narendra Modi. Right? So we know that the owners of the Hindu have no ideological love for Narendra Modi. That's very clear to me. Uh, 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 but th there is a sense in which you, you you're looking at you know the political economy, the business writing on the wall, and you're going you're going with the flow. So today I would say that uh, the ideological allegiance factor is there, and it's, it's probably more in the case of uh, Hindi media, where many of the owners, the Jagran Group owners, for example, openly are uh, pro BJP, uh, although they were also close to Samajwadi because that was the government for five years in the state. Uh, uh, but uh, in, in, when it comes to English, I can't say that the owner of India today has any, Mr. Mr. what's his name, uh, uh, Puri, Mr. Arun Puri has any ideological affinity for RSS, but he's quite happy to have Arshtak or Mr. Samir Jain. Samir Jain has no uh, ideological affinity with anybody, quite frankly. Uh, but he's quite happy to have Times Now uh, because it makes great, you know, solid business sense. Uh, and I don't think, um, I would say the language, I would say the picture in the language media is perhaps equally bad, if not worse. Uh, and this is not true just of Hindi. My sense of Bengali, Assamese, uh, Odia media, uh, I, I can't say if Tamil or Malayalam, but uh, uh, I know that in many states, in Karnataka, for example, many states where the BJP has a very hard sell, uh, you have media that is aligned with, with the BJP and that uh, is quite happy to recycle garden variety, communalism, uh, and a lot of these, a lot of the cultural agenda. Uh, and you know, you see it in other ways, right? So Rohingya, you know, portraying the Rohingyas as the biggest threat uh, uh, to uh, Indian national security. Uh, you know, many of these people just go along with it. And you, you can see this, you know, uh, fear mongering happening. Uh, I didn't mention, but one of the disturbing elements is year after year giving a, you know, Doordarshan refused to transmit, to broadcast the Chief Minister of Tripura's Independence Day speech because they said it had political content. But year after year, the RSS uh, Chief Mohan Bhagwat's speech, including a very filthy one he made, this Vijay Dashami, attacking Rohingyas and you know, all kinds of nonsense that he said, uh, that was given you know, live telecast on Doordarshan News, which is really something quite alarming. Uh, so I would say, you know, uh, role of English versus vernacular, are people undemocratic? You know, I'm not sure about, and this question that you asked about whether the, you know, why is it that Times Now and Republic are more popular? You know, the truth is that we don't have any way of knowing this, quite frankly. Uh, I'm, I'm speculating based on the amount of advertising or so-called TRPs, uh, but if you talk to the owner of uh, NDTV or you talk to somebody like Jawahar Sarkar, who ran Prasar Bharti for five years, he says TRP is all rigged. And uh, it has no bearing whatsoever. And in fact, this is the case. Uh, it is subject to a lawsuit actually right now as to how you know, the, the the design of this, uh, how you measure popularity. But I would I will grant that uh, they do have the ability to move conversations among the upper middle class, and that's an influential section of society. And what they talk about, politicians pick up, and then it has a way of making its way through to other me other forms of media. But if I go just by objective numbers. We do a very popular program on the wire with Vinod Dua called Jan Gan Man Ki Baat. Now, Jan Gan Man Ki Baat uh, uh, is a YouTube, you know, it, it goes out on YouTube and on Facebook. And YouTube allows you to compare the number of views. It's a public number that they display. 
and there is no program on any Hindi channel, uh, uh, which is news and current affairs, which attracts as many views every day as Vinod Dua. Like he gets, now he's clocking for each of his programs about 140,000, 150,000 YouTube views. In Facebook, it runs into lakhs. And there's nothing out that Z puts out, nothing that Arshtak puts out, not even Ravish, who's very popular, uh, matches those numbers. So I would say that actually, we don't know, uh, um, you know what is popular, what it is that people want. I think people, when they're given an alternative, will uh, gravitate towards it if, it's, if, it's, if it speaks wisdom, if it speaks uh, truth and honesty. And certainly the response that somebody like Vinod Dua is getting tells me that there is, you know, I'm, so I'm not, I'm not pessimistic about what people want. I think it's, uh, the issue is can we design uh, dissemination methods that reach, that allow, so we are quite happy, you know, we often find out that our videos have been ripped off and people are putting them up on Facebook as their own or on, on, on WhatsApp, we don't care. We said, because we're not doing it for, we don't get profit from eyeballs necessarily, right? So we say, okay, just do it, circulate it, it's fine. Uh, so I'm not, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about, uh, about that part. And I, I, I wouldn't say, I don't accept that uh, Arnab Goswami is giving what, what people want. I think that some people may want it. I know that his sponsors and owners want it, definitely. And it's a, this is a channel owned by a MP of the government. And this is what, so this is what he wants, that's for sure. Uh, but I'm not sure that uh, uh, this is necessarily what, uh, so this may be my, uh, my, my own hope, but we have no statistical way really of knowing this, quite frankly. Um, the uh, question of corporatization, you see, media is uh, increasingly corporate controlled. I mean, TV18, the Ambani group uh, has, it owns C uh, TV18, it owns CNBC, in India, it has a controlling stake through debt of NDTV actually, uh, and uh, uh, but its control and its influence extends beyond mere ownership. So even before it became a direct player, I remember when I was editor of the Hindu uh, back in 2012-2013, lots of news was coming out from the oil ministry of how the Ambani Group, Mukesh Ambani Group, was um, you know they had this big gas project, KG Basin and how uh, you know, the government felt that they were being ripped off by the, by the Ambani's because he was gold plating a lot of his costs and then paying less royalty to the government. So these documents were getting leaked. And apart from us and Business Standard, which, was a, which is a business paper, nobody would touch those papers. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe they were afraid of lawsuits or whatever it is, but, the, but they had influence over that. And it mirrors, I mean, politics is the role of big money in politics is much more today than it was 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, so, so I would say that these are all um, kind of worrying, uh, they're all worrying trends. Um, the 9-11, uh, uh, I, uh, who, who mentioned the 9-11 example? Um, that's right, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I would say, in fact, if, if my supposition is, if, if my political economy explanation <coughs> of um, uh, you know, business attitudes, playing a role in creating comfort space for media plurality is correct. Just like US corporate sector is divided over Trump, they were not, in the, in the run-up to the Iraq war, they were all lined up behind uh, the uh, Bush administration in terms of wanting to go to war and, you know, so that was reflected in the attitude of all your big papers. So, not, so that, tell, that gives us a clue actually that of the various factors that I identified, which is the attitude of big business, the nature of your state institutions and internal media integrity. It's, num it's, the, it's the political economy uh, of big business, that which is the, probably the most important factor. Uh, but when you have a division within the uh, uh, you know, corporate sector, uh, that creates space which allows all the other factors to, to play. Uh, Kavita, you're, you're right. See, the thing is that me, the ills of media in India are legion. And uh, I, uh, I would say that uh, as with even the US, for example, coverage of, coverage of so-called national security matters tends to follow the, the official line. You know, journalists, it, it, takes, it takes some courage and some integrity to deviate from the party line or the, or the government line uh, when it comes to counter-terror and all of this kind of thing where, A, you have no, or it's very difficult to develop independent sources of information. So people tend to go along with what, uh, and, and there you're right, and the media has been particularly craven and has been craven for a long time. I would say going back even before the current crop. So the, the 
anti-Muslim fake encounters are really, uh, they are the product of the Advani era. I would say you go back uh, 15, 20 years before to a lot of the um, counter-terror operations in, the, uh, in Punjab in the 80s and early years of, you had the same cravenness of media coverage, uh, which is the problem. But I, I would say that, um, uh, you know, that was part of a phenomenon which is in many ways universal that, that you know, media tends to follow when it comes to you know, internal security matters. But today what we have is something quite different. On fake news, you're right. I mean, the, big, the problem is that it's not, the, it's, it's not your bright parts that are, uh, that, are pushing, that are pumping out fake news or your, or your obscure Bulgarian websites that are you know, rooted through servers and then seen by people on Facebook. It's your mainline big channels, big papers that are fabricating news or even if they're not fabricating, they are talking up certain kinds of issues uh, and creating you know, controversies where none ought to exist or spinning something in a certain way that is very uh, beneficial to the ruling party. And I think this is the biggest uh, uh, cause of worry right now. I think I've covered pretty much all the questions. Uh, yeah. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we break for coffee for some 15 minutes.